Dr. Willie Parker. Welcome, Doctor. Before we get into uh, really everything that's in the book, just give somebody who has no clue, what is it like for a woman who is trying to have an abortion in the deep south, you know, places like Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi? Okay. If you're not familiar with all of the barriers that are in place, uh, the laws that have been put into place, that uh, even though abortion remains legal based on the road decision, uh, there have been lots of hurdles put, placed in the uh, path of women. Right. Um, things like waiting periods in Alabama, it's a 48-hour waiting period. Once you decide to have an abortion in Louisiana, it's 72 hours. Uh, in Mississippi, 24. So there are long waiting periods. There are financial barriers. Uh, those are just the institutionalized things. There's the stigma and the shame. Women are made to feel um, that they're doing something immoral by choosing their lives over the ambitions that other people have for them. Uh, if someone were to counter and say, why are you in such a hurry? Why not have a waiting period? Why not have 24 hours or 48 or 72 hours or any amount of time to wait on? What would your response be to those people? Well, it sounds good. Like, a, it's a com it passes the common sense test, but it's not informed by the reality. Uh, there's not a woman that I know who doesn't say that when she pees on that stick and it's positive, she says, I'm pregnant, oh great, or I'm pregnant, oh shit. And so as a result, uh, women have to, uh, being forced to wait uh, to indulge somebody else's sensitivities, um, is to say that we don't trust women with very important decisions. And I just beg to differ. You, you talk about in your book how it took you 13 years coming from a very religious background to change how you viewed a woman's right to choose. Why and how did you change your mind? Well, uh, I've always been uh, uh, pro-life, but what I mean by pro-life, pro-life of the woman. Uh, I've never been uh, opposed to a woman making that decision, but I was conflicted because I wasn't clear about what it meant to me personally to provide that care. Right. So I had to think about my religious understanding and my religious conviction a little bit differently. So uh, I think pro-life is a misnomer for people who are against abortion. People who are opposed to abortion are pro-fetus. Uh, I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life of the woman. And you can't have more of an interest in a pregnancy that a woman is carrying than you have in the woman herself. Now, in, in the past six years, there have been over 300 abortion restrictions that have been enacted uh, by states. This year alone, there have been uh, at least 46 anti-abortion bills that have been introduced or are pending in f about 14 states. What's really interesting is you have compared this, uh, the control over women's bodies, to slaveries, which to many people would be a bombastic term. Why would you say that? I think if you've never lived with your back to the wall, it would be really... Uh hard for you to understand what it's like to have the most essential aspect of your being, the ability to make decisions about your lives, your life, to have hopes and aspirations and dreams and to have that controlled by someone else. Uh, I, as a man, will never face an unplanned pregnancy, but I feel like I'm in the same position that uh, Abraham Lincoln was when someone asked him, why did you free the slaves? There are many reasons the Civil War was fought, but I like it when he said that, as I would not be a slave, so I will not be a master. As a man, I refuse to participate in a system that will deny women the same agency and the same uh, right to make decisions about their lives that I have as a man. You, you, you obviously face a lot of opposition taking this, this stance. Um, you know, traveling around, helping women who don't have access to abortions, women who are forced to travel to other states. The president said if a woman under Roe or if they, they change the laws is in a state where they don't allow abortion, then she can just travel to another state. Why is this such a big issue? Well, the problem with that is that uh, people in this country, under our Constitution, everyone should have equal access and equal protection under the law. So that means that one state's not free to impose its responsibility to ensure the health of its citizens 
uh, to another state. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line is nobody's health or aspirations should depend on their zip code. And if you say that a woman can just simply go to another state, that sounds nice, but it's not informed by the reality that many women face hurdles. And if the clinics are uh, uh, 500 miles away, it might as well be a million miles away. Or if a woman doesn't have the resources to travel, many women don't have the resources to travel in state, let alone going to another state. So I think it's, it's a very callous statement uh, to say uh, that uh, it's almost like Marie Antoinette, just let them eat cake. It's callous. It's callous and it, it doesn't take into account the realities of the situation that many women are in. You, you spoke earlier today about why on a day like today and this day every single year has significant importance to you. Why is that? Well, it occurred to me, Trevor, that <clears throat> this is April 3rd, the day before my book launch, and when I was told that the book would be launching on April 4th, there's a tab set in my heart around the fact that that was the day that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it struck me that tonight, 49 years ago, was Dr. King's last night on Earth. Uh, for me, what that means is that I like to imagine that I was the little uh, kid uh, living in Alabama who he had hopes and aspirations for that my dreams wouldn't be determined by the color of my skin. And so this book, my career, is really uh, a recognition of the vitality of the movement that he gave his life for. You, uh, <laughs> telling an amazing story. It is a beautiful book. Thank you so much for being on the Thank show. Thank you.